Hello, family. Welcome back to your work auntie podcast. My name is Collada Marie and welcome to episode three. And last week's episode, we talked about preparing for an interview so you can be confident, comfortable and confident. And so this week I have an awesome panel to talk to you about how to actually execute that interview successfully so that you represent that preparation in the best way. So now and I would like to pass you all to my uh, esteemed guest. Um, and I will start with uh, Mr. Damien Richburg. Hey, uh, thanks for the invitation. Excited to be here. Uh, quick background about me. Started off my career uh, in the mechanical engineering field. Uh, wasn't as interested in it as I thought. So ended up getting my MBA in finance. Uh, had a chance to work on Wall Street for a little bit. Uh, and then uh, through a, a series of circumstances, uh, ended up back in Texas. Uh, had an opportunity to interview for a CFO role. Uh, wasn't the right opportunity for me, uh, but the recruiter who brought me in uh, introduced me to recruiting. Uh, always open for a new challenge. You never know what you might like until you try it. And this ended up being something I, I really enjoyed. So uh, for the last nine years, I've been in the recruiting field, uh, currently vice president of recruiting for recruitability. Uh, and essentially what my team does is we hire for finance and operations, sales and marketing uh, and technology and engineering roles for a variety of companies across the nation. All right, thank you. Welcome again. And on over to Nate. All right, so good evening, everybody. I'm Nate Benjamin. Um, I like to call myself the people champion, diversity strategist, and the executive coach. I have about 20 years in the human resources, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, as well as EEO, uh, civil rights, you name it. Anything that touches people, that's what I do. And so I started this career, um, I was on a trajectory actually to go to law school. I had got into law school and I just had this pivotal moment where the, 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 the climb was to actually get in. I don't necessarily think the aim was to actually perform the work. And so I took a year off and I said, you know what, I'm going to try something different. I'm going to try something new. And that new thing was um, working with people. And so uh, I, I went into an organization that was focused on human resources, um, tried to get out for a while. I, I called myself also an HR rebel, tried to get out for a while. No matter what I did, I couldn't get out. But what I could do was get promoted. And so, you know, within 16 years, I ended up becoming a senior executive for a major organization. And I have been doing that work for, um, for now in the last 20 years. So happy to be a part of this conversation and ready to chop it up. All right, thank you. And I should have said Mr. Nate Benjamin <laughs> the same way I introduced Damien. Um, no, thank you both so much. And I'm sure you guys have a wealth of knowledge and this is gonna be a great conversation. So the first question I have is what is the worst interview you've had where you were the candidate and you flubbed that sucker up? <laughs> or you can take what is the worst interview you've ever conducted? <laughs> Uh, sure. Yeah, listen, I'll, I'll start off and I'll, I'll do a mixture of, of both. Um, you know, worst interview I've, I've ever had, um, I always prepare, uh, but I had a uh, interview with Goldman uh, when I was uh, in the capital market days. And I remember uh, going in there about as cocky as one can be, letting them know that I didn't really need this job. I already had an offer on the table. Uh, and look, in hindsight, I'm like, well, what, what, what was I thinking? Um, you know, they didn't call me back. Uh, they actually called me back later after I started. But, you know, in, in hindsight, um, there's a level of confidence and humbleness that uh, we need to take <laughs> into an interview. Uh, and at that point in time, uh, man, I, I did not. Uh, so that, that's, the, you know, personally, the, the worst interview I, I ever had, um, the worst interview I ever conducted, um, it was actually a face-to-face -face <laughs> interview. Um, and I fell asleep uh, while I was giving the interview. Uh, and, and somehow the guy didn't even notice. I, I remember <laughs> nodding off and looking up and he was still talking. I guess he thought I was taking notes, uh, but super embarrassing, moved through it and uh, made sure ever since yes. I, I had so enough I have a follow rest. Up. So was it uh, just he was very long winded and, and, and you were just tired or was it both? <laughs> Listen, I, I think all of us have had a chance to have some of these interviews, uh, and uh, man, yeah, uh, his it was monotone, and and that's something that 
that's huge. Um, you know, when we do interviews, it, it's, um, you know, someone's skill, their talent, how they approach the situation and then the rapport they build because you can be the best at anything. But if you don't have a rapport, uh, you know, it, it doesn't fly. And, you know, at, literally after that interview, I said that we got to make rapport a, a big part of it. Because regardless of the skills, Very if no so. one wants to talk to you. I've never fallen uh, to an interview, to definitely on a date <laughs> once, though. But that's for another podcast. <laughs> yeah, maybe it might be number four. All right, Nate, now that's your turn. Four, huh? What is your worst interview you've ever had? Or what is the worst one you've conducted? Oh, yeah. So the worst one I ever had was um, this particular organization that was in Germany and I wanted to get overseas so bad. And, you know, this was, you know, I was in my 20s and interviewed for the job and I knew that I could do the job. I knew that I could knock it out the water. And when I got on the interview and when the uh, the selecting officials started asking questions, I realized that they didn't know what the hell that they were doing because the questions were indicative of someone who didn't understand what they were hiring for. And so for a position that I wanted so bad, I started getting upset at the questions. And then I started giving rebuttals as to why the questions should not be asked that way, because this is never gonna help you get the talent that you're looking for. And then told them what they should have done in, in their questions. And so after the interview, you know, like Damien said, it's like, damn, like how cocky was I to tell the, the, <laughs> the selecting official that their questions weren't right, but I knew they weren't right. So then, you know, being young and being naive, I then further sent an email to the selecting official to follow up my concerns that I had from the interview. Impressive. So, yeah. So needless to say, you know, I didn't get a call back nor a second round. <laughs> I got a, I got an email where it was like, well, thank you for sharing with us your concerns. And, and that was it. And, you know, that could have been career suicide, but it, I, 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 I came back from it um, and ended up getting a much better job. So I felt validated, I guess. Um, but <laughs> the second, the, the, the worst interview that I have been, that I have administered, I would say it was with a candidate that it was recent, actually, is with one of my colleagues at my current organization. Um, <laughs> when, all right, let's say this. All right, we're on a podcast, right? I, I'm a diversity <laughs> expert. Listen, when we say show up as your authentic self, <laughs> don't. Hmm. All right? Don't. Show up <laughs> part of your authenticity but i need you to sprinkle a like if if you aren't the most professional person i need you That's to right. sprinkle a little bit of assimilation on your uh your your how you present yourself <laughs> this woman got on the call and every ebonic vernacular that she could find she used it and when she <laughs> finished the interview she concluded by saying peace well, peace. And that's how I responded back. It was so bad. I mean, she showed up so like just, you know, I, I appreciate yeah. authenticity. I appreciate everything, yeah. but it was not right. And she couldn't read the room. And when you don't read the room, then you end up with mm -hmm. no callbacks and nobody interested. Yes. Because guess what? She probably could have Because, yeah, being able but to read the room me, and recognizing who your audience is, a critical part of most of the roles we're trying to fill at this point. So, yeah, I definitely understand that being a concern. Um, for me, my worst interview was early in my career, which actually helped me never make that mistake again. Halfway through my interview, my interviewer started just looking pissed. Like, he was like, I don't even want to be here anymore. And what it was, I was answering the questions too long-winded. I was early in my career, and although I had tons of experience, I wanted them to know whenever they'd ask a question, I'd give like seven examples. I'm like, and then this one time, and then I also did, and this happened, and I think they were like, okay, shut up and just answer the question. So um, actually, and most people will not give you feedback, but I called and said, you know, can you tell me why I didn't get the interview or get the job? And she said, yeah, your answers were just far too long. You know, we didn't really know where to focus. It seems like you were very green, even though you have 
great experience. And so I've learned since then to be concise, get straight to the point, have one or maybe two at the most solid examples and then move on from there. So, you know, that's really why that preparation is important because I think I prepared, but not the way I do now. So I was just trying to cover every single thing. Like I'm the right person. It was probably also too overzealous. Um, The worst interview I've conducted honestly was the person the interview had 15 questions and the interview was over in about 18 minutes <laughs> yeah so the candidate just really did not answer the questions it was very much you know you're asking tell me about a time when and they were giving yes or no answers or just yep wow. i've done that yeah no examples no stories <laughs> you know nothing to demonstrate <laughs> just yes i've done that <laughs> I know what that is. (laughs) No, I did not get to the offer. So yeah, that was probably, I would say, one of the worst ones. I would say, (laughs) yeah, I've interviewed so much. Some of the best, so I'm going to offer a switch. The best interviews, and I'd like to hear from you all if you could think of one, is when I was with the consulting firm, I was interviewing college students. The way they answered questions to say they were college students just really was so inspiring. Like it was very thought provoking and they would stop and ask you questions to clarify your question. And they would give these really good examples. And some of them had created international programs and, you know, you know, done these great volunteer uh, programs. It was a political science program at a university and they were just so passionate and really smart. And we, and I was so sad because we couldn't hire all of them and all of them were really just amazing candidates and we were trying to whittle 20 amazing candidates down to like five um but i had i had some really great interviews and i was just thinking like if i could hire all of them i I would so yeah i would say those that was my best is interviewing those college students that really despite being early in their their career they really answered very thoughtfully and detailed any that you guys can think about (laughs) Yeah, so there was this, I interviewed this person for a chief learning officer role. And, you know, she and our friends to this day, I had, I had a very tight window. And so she was overseas. She was, you know, with her family in a village, she had to drive an hour and a half to get to Wi Fi, so that she can interview. And, you know, and I'll never forget her giving me this whole <laughs> soliloquy about how she couldn't get the Wi-Fi. And I'm like, okay, I don't care. I just need to fill the role. But she interviewed and did like incredibly amazing when she was up against people who had all came in for physical interviews. And so we had to do a second round and she came in and she she exuded confidence that nobody else did. And when she walked into the room, it was a panel of six of us. And like when we debriefed after the interview, everyone's just like, when she came in, you paid attention. And so I want to like bring that to a point of interviewing is that when you, you only get one time to make a first impression and interviewers are paying attention to you. And that first five to seven minutes is going to be critical. Like we're like, we're all humans, right? We're all creating our ideas of the person We're we're, we're sizing them up. We're we're creating the, those thoughts. And so that that's so critical. So I'll never forget. She came in and she <laughs> she had this little hat, right? <laughs> and she walked in and she put her hat on the counter and she kind of like owned the counter. Like, this is my counter and I'm putting my hat here. Right. And like, I was just like, well, damn, okay, we'll put your hat down. And she came in and she was able to like answer the questions. And it was the balance between like the, she wasn't cocky, but she wasn't timid. She knew her stuff, but she made sure that you knew that it was rooted from experience, um, not rooted from how important she is. She was able to demonstrate the success that she had for organizations, and she was able to do it concisely, but really following like, this is the context, these are the challenges, these were my actions, and these were the results that occurred. And so she came in, and I will tell you, we interviewed 18 people. I will never forget this. We interviewed 18 people. We dwindled it down to 12, from 12 to 6, 6 to 2, 2 to 1. She was the one. And she came in, and she revolutionized that organization. She built the program. And when she left from me, she went into industry and did the same thing and repeated it at a major tech company and now is doing it at another tech company that is about to go IPO. She mm, had it. That's it amazing. was amazing. And shout out to talent. her. 
do a big Best interview ever. Damien, can you think of any? Are you still thinking? You know, mentioning, thinking of something you said earlier about long-winded um, and then what Nate said about that presence. Um, you know, when I have my team interview, there's a portion uh, of just how people communicate in that style. Uh, and I call it TIE, it stands for tell, inform, and educate, right? So tell is that you know, 15 questions, 18 minutes. Now you ask a question, yeah, I did, I have. Uh, educates the other side, right? And, and I feel like that might've been you and before, the soliloquy of you know how I've done every minute thing. <laughs> um, and, and listen, if you're trying to get someone on board and you have the time, that might be the best case. But for interviews, you know, we, we say I, inform, is kind of that sweet spot where you're giving just enough information to let me know that you know what you're talking about, but also uh, leaving the room open in case there are additional questions. Um, and so uh, going with that and then setting the tone, I had a guy we we're looking at interviewing for the team. Uh, first impression walked in and he had a turtleneck on and uh, like the dress wasn't there. And I initially had this impression like not this guy, no way, no how. Uh, and, you know, from the first question that I asked to how clear and concise it was with just enough information examples to let me know that he was being his authentic self, uh, but also could do the job well. And the interview uh, proceeded that way so that at the end I was a, a fan of the guy and, and to be able to, you know, turn a uh, turn a perception around that much. Um, and, you know, we actually extended an offer to the guy, um, man, that, that wowed me. Normally I go in with the set and it's kind of there, but, but for this, uh, again, to, to take that perception and I can imagine if, uh, I don't even know if he, if he'd have came in, uh, and you know, his initial, uh, his initial approach and how he presented himself lined up, I probably not would have probably wouldn't have been as impressed. Uh, but again, uh, to, to be able to change my mind in such a fashion, uh, he, he gets the, one of the best, interview awards. <laughs> Can no, I be petty I for love a that moment? Acronym. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Nate. P pettiness is, is key. I, Go yeah, ahead. I just want to be petty for a moment. <laughs> what was wrong with the turtleneck? <laughs> <laughs> no, listen. Um, sure. So, so uh, before the interview, uh, it's recommended interview attire. Um, and so th there's a level of attention to detail there that was missed. Is that fair? Yeah. Very fair. Good. Yeah, <laughs> when we tell people, please be present on Teams or Zoom, and then they come on struggling with getting on Teams or Zoom. It's like you were clearly told this was an expectation yeah, that right. I would still see you. <laughs> Why didn't you figure out how to do this the day before? Um, and I, I think candidates don't realize that that is sometimes held against them when you think about attention to detail and other things. Um, and also doing too much, you know, if someone tells you, um, it wasn't an, an interview, but once we had so many applicants for a position that looked good on paper, we decided to do an assessment or maybe a case study. And so we asked them to not, I didn't want work. I didn't want free work. So I sent them a, set, a scenario and I said, well, read the scenario and then tell me how you would approach it. Like a short essay. Here's how I would approach it. I'd put a team together several candidates, not just one, sent us, like, it was about a policy. They sent us policy drafts. So I was like, well, thanks, but you also didn't pay attention to the question. Mm -hmm. So it's like, while, you know, I'm sure someone probably thought they wowed us, it actually, you know, we thought about mm -hmm. it, like, well, these policies are great, but then it also shows that they don't pay attention. Because, I, you know, we were very clear right. about what we wanted, which was your approach, not a product. So, yeah, definitely, like you said, attention to detail yeah. does matter. <laughs> yeah, it does. It definitely does. need a split hair. Um, and thanks. Uh, so I love the acronym uh, TIE. So teach, inform, educate, well, tell, edu tell, inform, educate. That's a good acronym inform, for the listeners yeah, yeah. to remember. <laughs> um, and then also, Nate, you actually called back to something I talked about in my last episode, which is CCAR, um, which is Context, Challenges, Actions, Results. And so I definitely talked to the view listeners about how important that is for especially executive level roles. You always want to frame your responses with that acronym. I also talked about STAR, which is, you know, Situation, Task, Action, Result, because they're used similarly, but definitely CCAR for your executive and leadership roles. 
So the next question I have for you all is how do you prepare for an interview? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll go first on this one. Um, you know, it, it's pretty simple in, in all honesty, right? Uh, after conducting a number and, you know, helping people prepare, uh, it's one, know, know the company, right? Yeah, you'd be surprised how many people go on an interview, have no idea what they do, how they make money, haven't done any research. Um, and, and look, regardless of how many interviews you have, uh, the reality is that person cares about them. You, you got to be able to do your research and understand that. And just as much as you need to know about the company, you, you got to understand what the role is and the needs in the role, uh, right? Because any hire is looking to solve a problem. And if you don't understand that, you're missing an opportunity to sell yourself because an interview is a, is a sales process, right? For all intents and purposes, you know, they're going to shell out money to bring you on board. Um, and so you got to make sure that, you know, you're able to communicate that effectively. Um, and, and then the last part is know why you over someone else. All right. Um, you know, the, the C car thing does a, a good job of getting you there. You know, uh, people, you know, you, you'll hear so many interviews. I, I want to know how you think, what's your approach, you know, even if it didn't work out, uh, the way you wanted it to, uh, you know, what was that thought process and being able to do all three of those things well uh, and then do it in a succinct fashion uh, can win you out over so many people. So many people are, are just bad interviewers, don't have the right details and don't come prepared. But you do those things in the right context, you're going to set yourself above so many people uh, by those things alone. Thank you. Great. How about you, Nate? Uh, yeah, I would I would echo everything Damien said, and then I would add on to understanding the business, but understanding the mission as well, and then being able to clearly articulate how you going into that position will help further that mission, mm -hmm. how to support it. You know, um, another way to consider it is if you're the boss and you're hiring me, how do I make you win? How do I make you look good? And yep. when I can show and demonstrate, these are the things that I would potentially do in order to make you successful by de, by de facto, I'm then being successful. And so I'm sharing with you vision. Yeah. I'm sharing with you how to support your mission. I'm sharing with you, this is the strategy, whether or not it's going to be the end all say all be all, this is a, a, at least a preliminary approach based on the position. One of the things when we think about a position is this, a position is generally put in place to help solve a problem. So if mm -hmm. I can't be a solutions oriented employee, then I probably shouldn't get the job. So I need to go into the interview being able to show how I can close the gap and speak to the solutions that's needed in order to make this organization win. So that that's how I prepare. Um, and so I, and that's how I like to see people prepare when I interview them, um, because what I don't want is for you to regurgitate to me what I put in the vacancy announcement, right? <laughs> like, I know what I need, right? Or at least I think, tell me more, tell me sure. more. Interest me in what you think that you can do, but I know how to do this work. I need you to advance it and make it better. So that's how I approach it when I'm interviewing and that's what I'm looking for when I interview. Solid. Thank you. Um, and so I talked all about how I like I prepared my last episode, so I won't, <laughs> I won't go back. So those of you who are listening, go back and listen to episode two. So I have what interview question do you think listeners should always be prepared to answer? Like if they had to write down four questions or two questions, let's make it easy to practice. What are your two go to always ready to answer questions? You want to take this one first, Nate? Yeah, we or maybe we can just tag team. Maybe I do yeah, one. Yeah, let's do, do it. We'll yeah, you know team. what? Let's 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 tag team. <laughs> there I, we go. I like that idea. <laughs> there we go. So I'm gonna tell you the question that you need to be prepared for. What are areas of improvement? Now you might say, "Well, why do I need to know this?" Or everyone has areas of improvement. I will tell you. I watched a scene. I watched a CFO or a an acting CFO take herself out of the runnings for a job when that question was asked because she could not come up with anything that she had done wrong or anything that she needed to work on. Now, if you're sitting in the damn job, sorry, I know it's a podcast, but if you're sitting in the damn job and you're acting, clearly the people in this room know of any, some potential mistakes that you've made because we're human. 
when you sit there and you cannot speak to any of your areas of improvement, what it really says, because it's not about you outing yourself. What it's about is that you have enough introspection to be able to identify areas for you to improve, which then in essence still helps the organization. When That's you right. say, oh, well, there's nothing that I can improve on. Well, then guess what? We are automatically going to be dealing with somebody who's status quo because what we got is what we get. And you have no <laughs> thoughts of even improving yourself, which means that you will never take this organization to the next level. That's right. Yeah, you know, Nate, that's a, a great point because you know, I tell my team, you know, my four tenets in life are collaboration, contribution, growth, and fulfillment. Um, and growth is huge. And the only way you can grow is realizing there are things that right now you don't do great and you can and get better at. So, you know, that's a, that's a, a very important thing to be prepared for. Um, and then, you know, also, you know, I think of it like uh, house hunters, right? You know, when when people go in, they could see a house, but you got to help them see themselves in it. And you got to help the whoever's interviewing you see you in the organization. And so uh, I, I literally listened to this thing today. It was a, a quick Instagram uh, post and it was about the difference between, um, you know, people who excel and people who don't. Uh, and, and it said, you know, people who don't excel have the same challenges that people who do excel uh, have. It says that people who excel uh, you know, for people who don't excel, they'll mull over over two weeks and people who do, they'll take 15 minutes. And, you know, being able to uh, explain how you've overcome challenges because every organization has it and everyone, if you're thinking about it and they have the right uh, attitude or looking to always upgrade and have the right people um, and being able to say, look, man, I don't care what the challenge is. Uh, here's here's the challenge I faced. Here's what I did uh, myself and working with others to overcome it. Being able to answer those questions will, will set you apart as well, because, again, you mentioned this whole status quo. Um, and if you don't recognize that nothing is perfect as is, there are ways to look at things differently or there are things that could be better, um, then you're going to miss the boat. And being able to prepare, you know, be able to provide examples of how you've done that in the past uh, will be a, a great move forward as far as moving you to that that final round, if not the offer. Yeah. So I guess the questions that we that you should be able to answer and we're doing the 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 the, the inverse, right? Yeah. OK, um, I, yeah, also, right. <laughs> <laughs> I also think that people miss this question and it's it's such an interesting question because you out of the eight point one billion people in the world, there's only one of you and people will bomb. Tell me about yourself. Ha <laughs> ha. Sure. Like you're the only person with the answer, right? Yeah, and I have listened to people go on tangents mm -hmm. and they've talked about maybe places that they've worked. They've talked about family and that's a part of you. So I get it. But it's like people sometimes don't think about that question in the context of the conversation. Right. So if I'm an employer and I say, tell me about yourself, let's talk about the things that you think that I would want to know. Right. Mm -hmm. Like if you go fishing every Friday, that's cool when you're talking to your buddies. Right. If you want to tell me about you've been married for 30 years and marriage is the key, that's fine. If you are at a marriage retreat, tell me what I need to know about you for the context of the position that you want to sit in. Right. Mm -hmm. So. Tell me about you personally, but make sure that the personal part is still in a professional manner. Tell me about your your career trajectory and how you've gotten to this place. And for me to be able to see from where you started to here that I can even see your success in growing from here even further up. Like, tell me the things that I want to know. One thing that I always tell folks is this, right? You better be able to tell your 30 second elevator pitch. Right. Because at the end of the day, if somebody wants to know about you and they want to hear about you within five minutes or 30 seconds, you need to be able to really hone in into this is who I am. This is what I do. And this is why mm -hmm. I bring value. So right. one of the things, for instance, I, I know you all are on audio, but, um, you know, we're here sitting in this room. We're looking at each other. But on my screen, I say who I am. Not, and it says. People champion, diversity strategist, executive coach. 
That's who I am. That's what I do. And guess what? If I got to give it to you in five minutes or 30 seconds, you're going to know who <laughs> Nate Benjamin is when we walk away from this conversation. Great. I like that. Yes. I like that. Let me, let me, let me add a little bit because, I, I, you know, similar but different, but also on the other side of pet peeve of mine. Um, you know, you got to understand your contribution to this jam, right? I hate interviews when people are, I said, tell me about this role and it's, about the company itself or everybody else but you. Like, I wanna hire you. Uh, and so, you know, the question you have to be prepared to answer is how you contributed to the success, right? And I mean, kind of goes along with the challenge, kind of go with what they said, but like, it's only you. I, you're the person interviewing, you're the person I wanna hire. I'm trying to be sold, and you telling me about how your boss did this and that, or, you know, um, you know, again it's 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 you and you have to be able now and now if you go through and you're saying right now but i don't know what to say then that's a problem you got to do better that's your right. job <laughs> so <laughs> you got to be a better contributor but but you know that comes to mind because again anytime you know I, i'm conducting an interview and someone can't do that effectively i'm automatically turned off that's just yes me. i'm glad you said that because when i interview people and all their answers are we did we did the team did sometimes i follow up if we have time and i'll say so what was your specific contribution sometimes i don't <laughs> especially if you gave sure, a long right. detailed answer so if you're out here and you go in with we answers you can say it was we it's okay to say it was your you were a part of a team um but what did you do specifically were you leading the team did you contribute to one specific area of the team were you the programmer the developer the tester um you know and if you were working in the store yes there's a team were you the closer did you run the cashier were you the pharmacist so whatever your role was be very clear about that right. cuz when you say we we as interviewers we don't know for like how to score you because we don't know what you did specifically. And like I said, some interviewers will ask you for the follow-up, but sometimes it depends on time and long-winded or whether or not you've, we've already decided <laughs> that we're not gonna move forward based That's on right. how you've answered other questions. So definitely agree with that um, and appreciate that. It was something you said earlier, Nate, that I was gonna add on to, but I remember later, oh, the tell me about yourself. Once we asked that in an interview, <laughs> And the person answered for like 15 minutes. <laughs> so we were all chatting. Uh -huh, uh -huh. We were like, oh my uh -huh. God, like, should we tell them to stop? We can't, we're not gonna get through the questions. And I just, we were nodding. And then we kind of started like, just cause we were on camera, we're like, okay. So like we all were gesturing, but they just kept going. And it was a 10 minute, tell me about yourself, which definitely cut into their, overall interview time so yeah so if you're going to tell us about yourself be able to do it in less than five minutes especially in an interview <laughs> yeah oh and can i can i add on to that too mm -hmm. um so i'm, I'm gonna just tell y'all a secret y'all i know y'all listening and maybe it's just me if the interview's bad i'm cutting questions right so if you mm -hmm. end up on an interview and you only got about five <laughs> questions please know we cut about right. seven along the way yeah. we've been yeah. talking through teams we've been talking as an executive board to say don't ask these questions why because you already knocked yourself out of consideration that's right that's right yeah see, i say i get the the luxury uh in most of the interviews of you know helping coach someone for the next round so even if it doesn't make sense and it's not for me i'll, I'll hey hey you got to stop you got to stop you you just been rambling you got to understand you're rambling right like and I, and I help coach people through like the whole point is to find out more about you if you don't know when to stop talking like what, what are you trying to help me understand right now by saying all this? <laughs> right. Oh, you don't even know. You see, that's the problem. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so yeah, 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 yeah. You're, you're spot, spot on. Gotta keep it. And for me, I don't know if you do this, but sometimes for the interviews we do, we everyone gets the, you know, I'll go all the way through, but if you're over time, any questions you answer after the time is, I'm, I don't care. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> like, I, uh, they don't count because i don't think it's fair to the camp like family the, feud right concise <laughs> kept in the time frame because when i start interviews i always say you have this many questions you have this amount of time and you mm -hmm. also need to leave time for yourself to ask answer, ask questions at the end 
So if, if you mess up or waste that time, that's on you. So I think people have to really consider and also know that most interviewers are also very busy. So we're also looking at our calendar thinking, sure. oh, my God, I'm about to be late to this next meeting or this next interview because, yeah, right, you're sure. not, you know, respective of time. Um, any so can other I, questions? Can I piggyback off of, oh, I want to piggyback oh. two things that you just said. So one. The, the 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 calendars are heavy so you have to manage your time like that I, I say the same thing to my interviewers we got 45 minutes this amount of questions it is up to you to govern you, your time accordingly but i will tell you when people draw you in they huh. can make you change your mind about that time mm -hmm. too that's true yeah, that's true because because i've leaned in a couple of times and I'm going to ask more questions. And for me, when I'm asking you more questions, it's not because you said anything wrong. It's because I'm feeling what you said and I want to learn more and I want to hear more because the more if you can really articulate what you're saying, it's giving me a window to your brain. And now I'm learning how you think. And when I'm learning how you think, I'm intrigued because your thought process might be able to help whatever deficits that I got going on in this organization. So I, I will say when you're when you're approaching your responses, use a systems thinking approach for it. Don't tell me what you think I want to hear, but walk me through your thought process, because that can really change the whole entire paradigm of the interview. Yeah, well that's good. So I want to switch up to what questions do you hate being asked when you're in an interview and someone asks you a question, what are the questions that you secretly roll your eyes on? Yeah, you know, it's funny because exactly what Nate said uh, when he was telling about his worst interview, like, holy smokes, man, you know, if you don't know how to interview, like get a coach. Because, you know, if you're trying to hire for a role, ask me where I want to be in five years when it's a basic role or I mean, whatever that looks like. Yeah, those things don't make sense. They're not, not adding value to today. Um, and, and, and to me, any question that's not focused on am I the right fit for this role? You got it. You got to squash uh, again, you know, out of respect for your own time interviewer. Uh, and out of respect for my time, you know, being interviewed. And so, like, I, I know it's not a specific question, but but again, anything that doesn't add value to figuring out if the person you're talking to is the right fit, eliminate. I'll keep it that simple. <laughs> All right. All right. Because so I'm going to tell you, I, I've interviewed thousands of people. <laughs> Please don't ask me benefits questions. I'm uh -oh. a selecting <laughs> If you don't wait till you reach out to HR and ask them about, I don't, I can't tell you about Blue Cross Blue Shield, health benefits, FSA. I don't care, right? Don't ask me that. Um, because it's just I don't I, no, like I'm the selecting official. Don't ask me that. Um, also, don't ask me about the pay. And you might hmm. say, well, why? And and I work in an industry where you know the salary ranges are posted. So let me preface that. Um, sure have the moment where should you have a conversation with someone and we're furthering along in the process that you can ask those questions but please don't 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 ask and then it's even the manner how you ask well how much is this job paying for? what like why are you at like no let's not do that um a lot of the questions and then and it goes back to what we talked about before i think damien you said it best research your company right if mm -hmm. you're researching the company to understand what we do then nine times out of 10, the questions that you're asking me about compensation are also out there and available. So do your homework first. Don't ask those questions. It just, it's, I don't know. It's, it's, it's just rude. Yes. So you answered yeah. as the interviewer perspective, which is great. But as a, when you were interviewed, what are the questions you hate to be asked specifically? Like when you, someone's like, Hey, <laughs> Nate, tell me about a time when, what is your eye roll question? I will tell you, I don't have a specific question, but I'll tell you what I generally hate. So I am I am a senior executive and have been for some time. Do not ask me questions that don't align with my posture or the role that I'm going into. So <laughs> as a senior executive, do not ask me tactical questions, because if you ask mm -hmm. me tactical questions, then that tells me that you're a tactical thinker. I don't want to work for you, <laughs> right? Because I'm a strategist and that's what you hire C-suite people to do. Um, if I'm a tactical person on the other end and you're hiring me to move four boxes and then you're asking me strategy questions, nah, where's the supervisor that should be hired in order to come up with that plan? So 
For me, the questions that I hate is when the questions don't necessarily align with the role that you're interviewing the person for, because it just shows me that you're misaligned and you don't know what you're doing. Yes. I'm glad you all are saying that part. I think people need to really realize that in your hiring process, the things that happen in the interview through your onboarding sometimes give you amazing insight into what you might be walking into. And so if you're at an interview and the yeah. questions don't make sense, the job probably doesn't make sense. <laughs> if, if the job description is um, all over the place and unfocused, the job's probably all over the place and unfocused. If the, you know, if they're not getting back to you in a timely manner, canceling interviews and rescheduling a bunch of times, all of those are red flags. And so as you, you know, you all as interviewers, you have a lot of power if you pay attention to not work into walk into a worse situation. So yeah, those are definitely things I hate. I de once I interviewed for a role and there was a question that I thought I bombed and I like mm. called some friends, we talked about it and everyone had a different answer. I actually did end up getting the job. And so when I talked with one of the panelists and I said, yeah, that question, I just didn't know what that is. And she said, yeah, no one knows what that is. So why would you mm. <laughs> include a question in the interview that no one knows the answer to? Cause that like ruined my day. <laughs> it's like, I, I thought I had this excellent interview and then you give me this trick question just because you're like, oh, we just asked, but no one knows what that is. Thanks. Yeah. So that yeah, that would yeah. be my pet peeve. Don't ask listen, people trick questions. I, I, I'll add this because you know, being a, a recruiter, uh, I'm in the middle of candidates and clients, and so I get a chance to, you know, coach, you know, people looking to hire as well. Uh, you create these job descriptions that are something you pulled offline and doesn't uh, abide with the role or you're asking for you know things that don't exist together. Uh, and I just feel sorry for candidates that end up in a situation where they're like, how do I convey? And they're like, no, these things go together. Like, oh, that's not that's not a, a one person thing. Uh, and you know, I, I get it. Uh, and, and the reality is that um, it's not just always the candidate that could use coaching. Uh, some of these some of these companies need to coach their hiring managers and their interviewers um, and, and, and really give the level of concern and intent because, look, it's a two-way street. You know, the, the candidate has to buy the job the same way you have to, you know, be on board with them. Uh, and I just throw that out there because, you know, a lot of people don't get a chance to, to know that and they think that the company has it all right. But like for all intents and purposes, Nate, uh, after they told you no thank you, they probably fixed themselves uh, <laughs> because, you know, they're like, oh, this guy has a point, but we can't hire him and let him know. But, but you know, I, I thought that was important for people to know. Yes. No, thank you guys for adding that. Um, so I'll move on to uh, some of you actually covered some of these. I did some research and found out what were the most hated interview questions. Um, and I'm going to list them and tell me if you agree that it's a bad question or if you don't and then why. The okay. one of the questions uh, was, are you a team player? Apparently that's one of the most hated questions by candidates. All right. Um, I, I don't hate it, but I don't love it. Hmm, right. Because this is not a team interview. <laughs> right. And hmm. so it's about me right now. And so we're, we're having this conversation where we're not talking about the we, we're talking about the I, but then it's like a team player. But the thing is, I'll tell you, no, I don't like it. I'm sorry. I, I, sorry. I don't like it. I'm gonna tell you why I don't like it. Because what am I going to do with this answer? Like this answer doesn't add value to the interview. And the reason being is this. If I ask you, are you a team player? Are you going to tell me no? Of course not. You're going to tell me yes. I've never interviewed anyone who has told me no. Okay. Everyone tells me yes, which means that if I'm scoring this, you're all at the same place. The mm -hmm. only way that you're going to be higher is if you give me credible examples that still speaks right. to your yes. So there's no real value. So I don't hate it, but nah, I can go without it. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm going to say I don't like it because any yes or no question is a useless one. Um, right. Like any question that you ask has to be able to provide depth. Uh, it has to be, you know, who, what, when, where, how, why type things. And if you're really trying to get to the essence of, how people work in the team. To Nate's point, like, God bless someone who says, man, I hate working in a team. <laughs> like, I mean, look, there are very few things that you're on an island, right? Uh, and so I understand why asking it, but to Nate's point, 
uh, man, even if you did ask it in a less yes or no fashion, I mean, what is it, what is it buying you uh, at the end of the day? Right. And we know that companies spend billions of dollars on training annually so that we can work better on teams. So clearly <laughs> we have solutions and we can help you with that. Uh, the next question is, have you ever had a conflict with a boss or supervisor and how did you handle it? Uh, yeah, listen, I mean, I, I'm, it's, it's weird because who I am today uh, and how I handle things versus who I was in the past is, is different, right? Like right now, I'm a subject matter expert. Um, and so regardless of who I'm talking to, I'm going to provide you my insight and opinions to why it makes sense, right? Now, in the past, uh, sure, but and you got to do it tactfully. Um, the, the, the one thing I will say how I approach things now is uh, there's this thing called the four agreements. One of them don't take things personally. Uh, normally, when there's a conflict, people take things personally. Uh, the way I avoid that is by understanding where that's coming from and, and why they have that opinion. So I can address that specifically and how my approach, if it differs, is towards that versus you. Um, and that's how I tend to handle it today. Uh, but look, man, I had to get you had to be in the mix a little bit to get there. Um, but again, you know, being able to not attack the person, uh, but be able to flex the idea because one of the five dysfunction of a team is the fact that there is a lack of conflict, right? Conflict generates uh, challenges and challenges, overcoming them help growth. Uh, and I've already talked to that. So that's my philosophy and I stick by it. But well, you answered the question, which is great. <laughs> How, did you, like, How would you answer some of these? But so would, do you think that's a good interview question? Have you had conflict with your boss? It's one of its most hated, or would you say it's a, a not a great question? I mean, gotcha. I, I see what you're saying. So <laughs> no, you're uh, good. <laughs> Everybody no, listen, I mean, again, again, <laughs> again, uh, you know, uh, tell me about the time you had conflict with your boss and how you handle it. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't I don't like the question um, because it's you know, most people are going to tell you something you want to hear. Um, you know, really good questions to me aren't as in your face. Uh, they kind of wrapped in something tasty, you know what I mean? And you kind of get there. So, so no, I, I don't, I don't like it because, you know, again, it, it depending on what the answer is, you know, you're going to make an assumption, but even the person answering it may not give you the valid thing. So, uh, I'm not a, I'm not a fan. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, so first I'm going to compliment Damien because yeah. he answered the question. Uh, he used two <laughs> books to support it. And I was listening. I was like, oh, yeah, those are two of my favorite books. So, and he got to the point in like less yes, than 60 yes. seconds. So that is an example. If you're listening to the podcast, that's how you answer a question. Um, but uh, yeah, have the question that you asked is, have I been, have I had conflict with the boss and how have I dealt with it? Yes. Um, I, I, I would say the same thing that Damien said, you know, you go through the schools of hard knock, um, you, you, you learn how to deal with it. How I dealt with conflict now is much different than earlier on in my career. Um, I can just use an example now where, you know, um, somebody who I've worked for had this idea, right? I'll just say idea. And they, they said, you know, Nate, you should do this. And I want you to do blah, 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 blah. And gave me all the reasons as to why I should do this idea. And, you know, unfortunately, the idea didn't make sense. It didn't. And, you know, I'm, I'm the executive that's hired to lead this organization. And so, you know, I was able to articulate that, you know, I understand your idea, but walk me through your thought process in how you would want to see this effectuated. And the sure. thing about it, in my mind, I was really thinking, hell nah, I ain't doing this, but <laughs> you can't say that y'all. So if you listen to the podcast, <laughs> don't say hell nah. That authentic self, we don't want to show up at work, right? So, but I asked I asked the person, I said, well, walk me through your thought process. And, and the more they walked me through their thought process, we realized that there really wasn't one there. Mm -hmm. And mm. so the more that person started to speak to what their idea was, it wasn't rooted in strategy. It wasn't rooted in outcomes. It was a quick, good idea. And what I could have done is said, okay, person, I'll do it. And then I would have been wasting time, organization's mm -hmm. time, trying to run down a rabbit hole that did not yield any outcomes or any results. But because that? I was, it was okay for me to have conflict with the thought 
but not necessarily the person. And let's have conversations to identify what outcome that you're looking for. Once that conversation came, it didn't really have to be a conflict. We were on opposing sides, but I de-escalated the conflict by elevating what was the uh, intended uh, outcome. And so that way, when we can have conversations to help get us to the same place, people, you'll realize with sometimes with folks, they don't really have the thought process from A to Z. They just got a quick idea. But if I'm the person that's supposed to implement, let me tell you why that doesn't work but I'm gonna give you a real well thought out way. And so at the end of the day, our conflict was over in 15 minutes because we moved forward in the way that you hired me to. So I'm gonna change my answer. I, I like the question. I mean, look, man, uh, yeah, I got to learn a lot about natures now. So let's keep that one on the board. Let's keep, okay, let's keep that. Keep that. <laughs> I'm good with it. Um, I was asked in an interview once, have I ever received negative feedback from my um, employees? And I was kind of surprised by the question, but funny enough, I had prepared the answer <laughs> um, the way I, I practiced and I was able to answer. But and I told them a very honest story um, about a time when um, because this is my podcast, I say curse words. One of my employees told me, yeah, because you weren't doing anything. I thought you were dumb as hell. She said another curse word to me. <laughs> but, and in the moment, I was just like, I didn't even get angry because I wasn't doing, it was a role where what I was told about the role and what actually I was needed to do didn't align. And so I wasn't perform. I wasn't being a good manager or a team lead. I was letting them do, I just sat back and kind of focused on some other things. And so I was sort of saying to them at the time, like, oh, I didn't realize that this is the kind of support you all needed from me as a leader and apologizing. And then that was what they said to me. And then I just said, well, you, I was like, elaborate. And then they further explained about times where they felt frustrated by my responses. And I just said, okay, well, hopefully I could change that perception. And I just moved on. And to this day, I, we yep. still talk. I didn't get mad. I didn't yell. Um, and, you know, those are fighting words, as we say in the streets. But I was yeah. like, well, <clears throat> you know, I, I didn't show up in the best way. And so I just kind of owned it. And we had a great conversation. So I think it's kind of in yeah. the same vein. But I think those it, questions it will catch people off guard. So be prepared to talk about conflict, guys, regardless of what it is. You should have some example of some sort of conflict because someone will ask it whether you all hate it or not. Um, another question yep. that people hate, apparently, is do you work well under pressure? And so is that a question you all like or don't like as well? Hate it. <laughs> <laughs> hate it. Hate it. Hate it. Um, because you know what? <laughs> um. All right. How do I say this? I don't know of a job where there isn't some form of pressure. Okay. And so to be fair and uberly respectful, I don't really care if you work well under pressure. I care. Do you, are you able to get the job done? Mm. I, I'm sorry, like, because <laughs> like whether you ha are having a unicorn and Daisy's day, or you're stressing and you're sweating in order to get it done from the human standpoint. Yes, I, there's humanity. Yes, there is empathy. Yes, I want to support you to make sure that you have the, the necessary tools in order to be successful. Absolutely. But the key is to be successful. Mm -hmm. So there are some people that are going to have high anxiety and get the job done. There are some people that nothing bothers them and they might not get the job done. I'm not here to do anything outside of get the job done, support you in the process, but get the job done. So for me, do you work well under pressure? And then who's going to tell me no? <laughs> oh, I'm horrible under pressure. <laughs> well, <laughs> what's the value add? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll stick with yes or no questions. I'm all against it. And, you know, um, I, there's a there's a scenario and then tell me about how you fit in this scenario and if you're asking the question hey listen we have a lot of tight deadlines here in fact you know sometimes priorities change and you may find out something at the drop of the hat you know um give me you know help me understand how you deal with that right and and, and i mean look you, 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 the the question itself 
um, has value, but it's how it's how you frame it um, that really gets you to the solution. Uh, because if someone, you know, I, we literally had uh, someone uh, had a I had a chance to sit on a client's interview with a candidate, and the client said, uh, "How do you deal with multitasking? Right? Not can you do multitasking? How do you deal with it?" And the response that they gave, uh, I was like, "Ah." Fair enough, wasn't what they were looking for, but it gave insight into the thought process. And Nate, you've mentioned that a few times, right? What, what you're really trying to get at is how the person thinks. Um, and so the question and its intent feel legit, but that framing uh, feels flawed. <clears throat> Can I can I chime in just real quick on that? And I agree with that 100%. I had a candidate we framed the question really in the exact way Damien just said it. It was like, you know, this is a high, uh, fast paced organization. We have multiple deadlines, competing priorities, uh, high profile, blah, 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 blah. How would you deal with? And we gave them an example. And they said, you know, something along the lines of, oh, well, you know, I am a project manager. I prioritize, blah, 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 blah. Right. So then I leaned in and I said, well, if you have these two competing priorities mm -hmm. and both have to get done, how will you do so or how will you ensure that that's effectuated this <laughs> i will never forget this candidate said well something's going to have to give thank you for your time <laughs> if you're on the audio i am i'm putting my hands together i'm wiping my hands clean because that person <laughs> is not getting a job in this organization something doesn't have to give Right. We have to get it done. Now, the answer could be maybe, you know, if I can't do both, maybe I'm pulling in my supervisor, maybe I'm pulling in colleagues, maybe it's a team collaboration. It doesn't mean that you have to be the problem solver for everything, but you have to have right. the thought process of how to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. When you tell me something's got to give and we got a CEO <laughs> that is going be uh, before very important people and you are the gatekeeper to the answer, no, or something's got to give is unacceptable. Right. Hmm. I agree. Yes. But it's a couple you all, you all sort of covered is, was the, what is your sure. greatest weakness or opportunity? That's one that people commonly list. I've seen actually like whole LinkedIn threads. People hate this question. <laughs> and so, um, you know, as you all said, it, everyone has one, right? Or we have opportunities or things we need to work on. And then you can also frame things that are not necessarily weaknesses, but that can be seen as a weakness if you overdo it, because that's what a weakness is. It's an overdone strength. And so you could frame it in that way and then immediately follow up by how you manage that weakness. You know, if you're someone who is too candid or sometimes you could be overly direct if that's your weakness, talk about how you manage that. Um, but that was listed um, as one, but it sounds like you both like that question. But can, but can we talk about that question? Okay, just go ahead. <laughs> 30 seconds, right? right. But when people say, what is your greatest weakness? And then you say something along the lines where I take on too much. I overwork. I... Shut yeah, up. That, like, yeah. come on. Yeah. I hate yeah. that response. I don't hate the question. I hate that response because you're giving me a response that has absolutely nothing to do with a weakness. You're telling me that because it's like, I work so hard, so hire me. It's like, pick me, pick me. And that's not really helping me understand where you can be further developed. So I will say I don't hate the question, but I hate the response that generally ensues with that question. Yeah, it does. And if you take too much on, that says there's a challenge with how you prioritize work. So what you're saying is I don't know how to prioritize work and you're going to have to assist me because I'm going to overwork, not prioritize, and then be really burnt out. And then you'll have to deal with that fallout. So. That's actually not, definitely not a great answer. Um, so if you're listening, <laughs> don't let that be your answer. Um, another question that people listed that they hate is where do you see yourself in five years? And Damien, you actually oh, said I, that earlier. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Horrible question. Oh my gosh. I mean, look, dude, you know, I, I still get clients to say, uh, you know, I'm looking for someone that's going to be here for the long haul. Are you serious? Do you know how the job market works? Like people don't, Stay. In. If you get somebody for three years, man, kudos. That's a that's a long time these days, right? And so that the, that question is antiquated, in, in my opinion. Um, and there are so many other ones. Uh, and also, uh, what if I ask you the same thing? Uh, would you be able to have an answer? Uh, I mean, and so you know, I I, I don't need to say any more about that. Not a fan. Don't ask. 
hate the question, but if you're asked, tell them that uh, hopefully in this role. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, I was asked that in one interview and I answered honestly, I was like, I don't know, probably working somewhere else. <laughs> I was like, oh, back with the government. Cause I, was, I just didn't feel like lying. It was like a job that I was also yeah. not trying to impress. I was like, I'm here, I could do the job. This question is not really relevant. So I was like, yeah, I don't know. I might be working somewhere else. I could be back in another role. And they said, oh, well, thank you for that answer. <laughs> I mean, what can you say? Yeah, I listen. Uh, I, I mean, what what answer? The, I don't even know what answer someone wants, right? Because right. technically, I should say, uh, you know, given my level of ambition and what I'm looking to accomplish, your job, but that doesn't fly either. So I, I don't <laughs> even, I don't even know what kind of answer someone is seeking uh, when they ask that that question. Um, yeah. Yeah, I definitely don't ask it because um, I do want to say, and, I, and definitely with Nate here, there are some questions for those of you listening that are man hiring managers that you should not ask is you should never ask someone if they've been fired, <laughs> if they've been arrested. Um, are you hmm. comfortable working with any sort of races, uh, sex, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> sexual preference? Those are not questions you should be asking. And if you do ask those kind of questions, please immediately stop. Um, and if you have been asked those questions, please call your lawyer. Immediately. <laughs> so, are there wow. any other questions that either of you want to share? Like, just like, don't ask, you know, that you don't want to get yourself in trouble. Don't ask about family. Hmm. So are you married? Do you have kids? What, I, I'm sorry. What does that yeah. have to do with with the yeah. job? And then, you know, we know that there are certain biases. And mm -hmm. so there's a lot of biases around, you know, well, people who are married are X or people with children are more Y. Like, nah, like keep it, keep it, keep it a buck. Keep it 100. Ask questions that you can ask everybody and um, they can e be able to equally respond to. No personal questions. Don't ask. Them. Yeah. Or do you plan yeah. on having children? which I- Oh God, so oh God. My, early in my career, there was a couple managers where I worked that would ask people, do you plan on having children? Yeah, that, that's yeah. gotta be scratched from the interview question yes. book. Um, and, 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 you know, again, there are so many questions that probably shouldn't be answered. And I'll reiterate what I mentioned earlier. I mean, you're, you're trying to hire a person to, to do the job and excel in areas that may not have, you know, been excelled in, in the past. And so all your questions should ideally focus around that. Uh, and they should be open-ended enough for people to add more color uh, than you would from yes or no, uh, right? So, so you know, that's just general rule of thumb. Um, and, you know, that provides you enough information to ideally uh, qualify someone over someone else. Um, but things like that and, oh my God, you know, do you plan on having kids? <laughs> I can't, I can't, I'm cringing just yeah. trying to think of someone being in that situation. <laughs> yeah. What are the best questions for a candidate to ask the interviewer when you get to the end of the interview and they say, what are the questions you have for us? What are like one or two questions you like you should always ask when you get that opportunity? I yeah. like to hear, uh, no, Damien, you got it. Yeah, yeah, you know, I, I, you know for, for me, um, and dude, you might have even mentioned this, Nate, but it, it's, I want you to be successful hiring manager, right? So, you know, you know, you hired me in this seat six months from now, what have I done or accomplished that helps you understand you made the best decision? Right. Um, I, I think that's a, a really good one. And those kind of answers, you know, uh, when, when they, when you get that kind of insight, they'll let you get a clearer understanding of what they really want from you in a job. And if you can add color to that, uh, to help them understand how the, that you get there, uh, you know, that, that also helps you out. All right, Nate. Damien uh, responded with my response. <laughs> um, I mean, the only thing I had different was 90 days, but I mean, we're on the same page, so I can't even. No, listen, so, so... I, 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 I put six months because, you know, we have a, a, a three-month guarantee, so I want people to be around right. for a long time. But, but yeah, Got yeah, it. 90 days is a good good litmus test. <laughs> or, or, or we'll just say three to six months. How about that? There you go, yeah. three to six months. There you go. Man, yeah. I'm going to change it up now. <laughs> There you go. There you go. Yes. Yeah, yes. that's my response. That's that's it. No, that's, that's definitely a good question. Like uh, Nate said earlier, when you start asking questions about things that are publicly available, like compensation and other things like that, like that's not really the best time. Um, 
you know, I do commonly get asked, like, when will you make a decision or when will I know, um, which I actually talked about in my last podcast. One of my colleagues was like, I hate when people ask me that. I, I hate don't it think too. it's a good question in the government because that process can be really long, but I don't know. I guess it depends. I don't know, Damien, what your thoughts are on how long, when will you know who you're hiring? Yeah. I, uh, listen, Let me just jump know. in real quick. Oh, go ahead, Damien. No, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead Nate. No, I was just- I was just gonna say hate it, hate it, hate it, hate it, hate it. I hate that question. That is the one I hate mostly out of all of it. Because in my mind, I'm always orchestrating a response in order to sound really, really, you know, professional and collegial. But in the back of my mind, I'm thinking when we call you, if we call you, is when we make the decision. Because then it's like you're almost tasking me to then tell you when I'm gonna call you back. And then more than likely, every candidate, I will tell you, not every candidate, I won't say every. Most candidates that ask me the question are never the ones we want to hire. Hmm. I've never had a strong candidate say, so when are you making a decision? It is just a sign of desperation for me. And Uh. it vexes my soul when someone asks me that question, because I feel like you're tasking me to provide to you a response back. When you see that you didn't get the job, you see it's filled, you see there's a notice that someone else is in it, or you get a call, that's when the job's been filled. Appreciate you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and, and to go back to the, you know, questions to ask, um, I, I do encourage candidates to ask um, along the lines of, hey, listen, is there anything I can clarify or, you know, you want to dive into, uh, you know, before we, we part ways uh, that, you know, help you make a help this decision, you know, be easier for you. Something along those lines, uh, you know, I, I Anytime, you know, you go through a series of questions, you know, oh, yeah, one more thing. And, oh, yeah, I'm glad you asked because you mentioned this, you know, better get it out on the table than to leave it a mystery. Um, that That's another thing I always suggest someone ask. Yes. Um, and what about questions about whether this is a new role or um, to the organization or, you know, Sometimes I've had people ask what happened to the last person, which I think is very weird, but <laughs> I I don't mind answering, is this a new role? <laughs> I think that's a little bit, uh, a little more, uh, less uh, possibly contentious uh, answer. Yeah. So I, I think asking if it's a new role is an incredible question. Hmm. And the reason being is because one, if it's a new role, that gives the candidate the understanding that they might be able to help shape what this looks like. That's right. And so, I, th- I mean, I think it's an excellent question. Um, what happened to the last person? Eh, hmm. I- I'd like to dump that question with a revision. Sure. And I do think that it's okay to ask something along the lines of, you know, I- I'm-, I'm trying to frame it. Let me just tell you what I'm thinking. Like, Maybe if you're asking about the time frame that the previous person served in it. Um, And and the reason why I ask that is because you can still kind of get to the, okay, well, this job, somebody left in six months, it's a red flag, but you can frame it along the way of like, how long was the previous incumbent in there? And what were some of the success stories from that, from their role? So I can know how to potentially pivot or to help continue the great work that's been done. So it's kind of like a way to reframe it. Um, while still trying to get the skinny on what happened to the person before. Yeah, you know, again, I'm a, maybe a little more brazen than some, uh, but to kind of get it all together, you know, I would say, hey, can you help me understand, you know, why the role is open, right? Um, now, what happens there is people love talking. So they'll, oh, you know, we're growing and we just created this role or the person in the seat before this didn't pan out. And when they answer the question, then it gives you permission to ask some of those other things that you really wanted to ask, but couldn't. Um, but I, you know, understanding why the role is open, whether it's growth or replacement is fair. Um, and the response will allow you to ask more in, uh, a more detailed question if, if you need to. Damien said something that I think is pivotal. Um, when you ask the right questions, people will regurgitate and tell you so much more. (laughs) So the more you can ask open-ended questions, because keep in mind when you're interviewing, it's not just you're interviewing for the company. Mm -hmm. You're also, the the company's interviewing you, but you're interviewing the company. That's right. And so when you ask them open-ended questions, you'll be able to get the answers that you're looking for. One thing that we didn't mention is from the, Damien said this really well, 
you know, yes or no questions, eh, like what are you really gaining from that? But when you're asking open-ended questions, open-ended questions really should try to like speak to some type of competency or some type of skill that you're seeking, right? So if I'm asking about, you know, how do I deal with, you know, um, competing priorities, that might be, okay, I want to understand how someone leads change, right? Mm. Or if I want to understand how people deal with conflict, that's how people deal with like leading people, right? Different competencies that undergird what the questions are. So when Damien mentioned asking those open-ended questions, the companies will spill. They will speak, but you have to know, okay, I'm asking this open-ended question, but in the back of my mind, this is the goal of what I'm trying to learn. So I need to frame my question <laughs> in a way to get that response without directly asking it in that manner. That's that's listen, Nate, man, you know, we should we should hang out because what you just said is something I tell my my team all the time. There has to be a level of intention. Right. What are you looking to accomplish? And then frame the question in a way that gets you there. Uh, that's the, you know, look, man, that's, it took me a long time to, to learn it. So if anyone listening, you know, wants to be better at a lot of things, first start with intention um, and then work backwards from there. Uh, and man, you'd be surprised at how how much you can achieve. That's great. Um, so before we wrap up, I just want to let the audience members know where can they find you to if they want to reach out to you to ask you any questions or, you know, find you on other podcasts, speaking events, whatever. Um, so, uh, Damien, where can they find you? Yeah, listen, the easiest way to reach me is probably LinkedIn, Damien Richburg, CFA. Um, you know, there aren't a lot of me on LinkedIn. And you'll you'll probably see me smiling with my hands folded and some pose, but uh, look, I'm, I'm here to help. Uh, you know, it's a passion of mine to add value. Uh, so if I can, please do, um, you know, if I can help you, please do reach out and I, and I guarantee I'll get back to you. Thank you. And Nate, where can they find you? You can also find me on LinkedIn. I'm the only Nathaniel H. Benjamin. <laughs> um, so you will see me on there, dark skinned fellow with some awesome, incredible locks. But guess what? I'm your people champion, your diversity strategist, and your executive coach, Nathaniel H. Benjamin. Find me on LinkedIn. There you go. Right. Yes. Thank you both so much. And to listeners, um, wherever you're listening, I want you to like, comment, subscribe, follow, uh, leave some comments, ask any questions. Um, I regularly connect with both Nate and Damien, so I can always bring them back for a follow up or a round two. I think this was an amazing session. I'm sure that everyone listening learned so much and you'll probably have lots more LinkedIn followers. Uh, so thank you both so mm -hmm. much. Thanks for having us.